Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the show. Fernando, how are you? Good, how are you? Wonderful. There you go. If your eyes are astute, as most of yours are, you recognize that door panel. You're like, hey, I've seen that before. There's a oh, What could it possibly be? A Ford F-150. Mind blown. Don't worry about it. As we've said in past videos, it's not necessarily the Ford F-150 that's the most important part of this video. It's what's going into it. And today we have a lot of cool stuff going into it. It's a basic build in the sense that this wasn't crazy money to do what he did. And you might be asking, what stuff is that? Right, Fernando? Tell me, tell me, tell me. Well, here we go. We're going to be putting in a kicker key 501 on two 10 inch subwoofers underneath the back seat, which we'll talk more about kicker key in a minute if you guys aren't familiar with it. And the kicker key 204 on the front stage. This is going to just power the front stage. The radio we are putting in rear speakers will be powering the rear speakers. For speakers, we're gonna be going with the Morel Maximo Ultra 602 six and a half inch component set and the matching coaxials in the rear door. And then for subwoofers, we'll be using a set of Kicker Comp RT10s in a B box from Atrend. We'll also be running a full power and ground in this four gauge. These two amplifiers have together combined 80 amp current draw, awesome. This car has stop start, we're not gonna have to bypass it. Let's take a look at the amplifiers and I'll tell you why. Kicker key, what is it, what does it do, why are we going with it? All those fun questions, but right off the bat, one of the things that we mentioned was we don't have to bypass the stop start and that's these logos right here on top of the amplifiers. Why we would need to bypass it, stop start for those of you that have it is, is kind of a pain in the butt. For those of you that don't know what it is, it's a feature and some of you guys have seen this before when you pull up to a stoplight and the car stops, the engine shuts off like a golf cart. It'll stay off until one of three things happen. You press the gas pedal, it's off for a certain amount of time or the voltage drops below an acceptable amount for the car to start back up. These are designed to work at low voltage in the sense that when that car starts back up, the battery can sometimes drop below eight and a half volts. Most amplifiers don't like that. They're only designed to work down to like 10 volts, some nine. So it's borderline on those. These are designed to work with stop start vehicles that won't cut off. And that's what happens when the car starts back off, your audio system cuts off for a second and then it turns back on once it gets above that voltage, which it can be irritating. Stop start in most vehicles are simple enough to bypass, but with these amplifiers, it's not even a concern. You don't have to worry about it. As far as what key brings to the stage, the kicker keys are DSP'd amplifiers, but not in the sense that you have to plug them into a laptop. They auto DSP. Let's start with the 204. 204 is unique feature built into it is the fact that it comes with this guy right here. This is a microphone. This microphone is designed to listen to the acoustic output of the stereo and tune the car automatically. This will mount to the top of the headrest, which once we get this in the car and we go to the tuning phase, we'll walk you through that process. It has an on off switch built here into the microphone, which allows you to hear it before and after as well as activate the system. But this listens to the speakers, EQs everything. It also time aligns it, so it'll bring all that sound stage together for you. In this particular vehicle, we are gonna be going active front stage. So this amplifier is designed to hook up two ways. Full four channel, meaning front and rear. You can do components on the front and coaxials on the rear like we're doing. Or if you want, you can also do an active front stage, which is what we're gonna be doing in this vehicle because it's got rear speakers, but they're not that important to us. This automatically will figure out what you're using for a front stage. Are you using a tweeter? Are you using a high frequency mid? range. In this case, we're going to be using a tweeter, but because it has this microphone, it automatically listens to it when it's playing its frequency burst and says, ah, that's a tweeter, sets the crossover appropriately. In the box, you get two zip ties. If you want to mount this somewhere in the dash, you get the strap for the microphone. You get the power plug. So this has your speaker output and your 12 volt power input. You get a fuse holder. This takes a 20 amp fuse and you get your input RCAs. This amplifier will do high level or low level. What the reason why this is so long is so that you can cut it here and 
and remove these and hook this up to the high level output of your factory radio, which is what we'll be doing in this F-150. To do that, we will be using this harness here from Metra. This is the plug and play harness for their DSP, which we don't need because we have this, but the harness will still work. It's the AX DSP FD2. This will work up to 2019 F-150s. That's as far as we've tested it up to. And inside this box real quick, there's two harnesses. This big guy here, which you don't need, but this guy here you do need. This is what's gonna plug into the back of the radio. It has your outputs here. There is a bag of screws as well as the amplifier itself. Getting the amplifier out of the box. On the power input side, you have a protect LED as well as a power LED. Flipping the amplifier over, there's a whole bunch more stuff. In the top corner here is where your microphone goes in. And then you have this row of dip switches. The dip switches are what gonna tell this amplifier what you're doing with it. The first switch is going to be auto turn on. That is what is going to sense the DC offset. This amplifier comes with Fit2 technology. Fit2 will sense a DC signal coming out of the factory radio down to three volts. Fader on and off. In this case, we will be turning that off because it's just gonna power the front speakers. Compression on, by amp mode, we'll be turning that on. EQ on and off, and time delay on and off. The reason why they put on and off for those is obviously you're gonna turn them all on and let it do its thing. And it'll test for those when it's doing its initial testing. However, some people will not want time delay, some people will want time delay, some people want time delay but no EQ. So all of these things are capable of turning on and off for your pleasure and your listening enjoyment. The next two switches over here are gonna be for the crossover built into it. This will auto sense when it's in the bi -amp mode what channel one and two is hooked up to, a tweeter or a mid-range. So you don't have to worry about the crossover for that. You're worrying about the crossover for the bottom of that six and a half. You don't want that six and a half to play full range. So your options on this are, are 60, 80, and 120. You notice there's two lights here. These are your distortion detection lights. One is for amp one, one is for amp two. It's a four channel amp, so basically front and rear. Radio detect. For this, we're gonna be turning it on. This will put out an ohm load to tell the radio's factory amplifier that the speakers are still connected and to perform properly. The F-150 just needs a small ohm load in order to control the output of the class D amplifier. It will still play audio without an ohm load on it. However, it's best to have it on these or you could blow your tweeters. Other vehicles, let's say if we were working on a Dodge, definitely needs the ohm load or you'll get no audio out. Let's take a look at the 501. Inside the box, you'll find a quick startup sheet. This is what Kicker's doing in a lot of their amplifier boxes now to conserve on paper, but this is the QR code. So if you scan this, this will take you off to the instruction manuals online so you can download it and take a look at it on your phone or your laptop, whatever you like to do. But on the back, there is a basic startup guide, which is also in the 200.4. They have a, hey, read this. Inside, you'll notice that this doesn't have the microphone that the 204 had, but it's still a DSP amplifier. This just does it a different way. We get an Allen key, inputs, nice and long, just like the last ones. This does have the same high level capabilities as the 204, works the exact same way. Bag of screws and those two zip ties. This being a sub amp though, is a little different. On the powered input end, it has an eight gauge input, has 10 gauge speaker outputs, along with a remote turn on in. Your power and protect lights have moved to this little area here. On the other side, you'll see an option for a base knob. The key activation switch, which is for programming, your high pass or subsonic filter, low pass crossover, bass boost, DC offset select, as well as input levels high or low. One of the many things that are cool about the kicker amplifiers is we can use the 402's remote turn on as an output to feed the input of this amplifier. We don't have to use DC offset on both. So we don't have to worry about them both looking for that signal, any weird things. We could also do the same with this. We could use this DC offset to turn on the other amplifier in the chain. So if we're going with this amp to power, let's say a sub, but you already have another amp that's powering the highs and you're on a factory radio and that one doesn't have DC offset. When you flick that, the inputs become outputs. It's really kind of a nice feature. We still will need to tell it that it's high level. But we can make sure that the DC offset is off. Now, how does this key amplifier do its magic? Well, because it's a sub amplifier, it doesn't need to listen to the whole car. It just needs to see what signal is coming into it and it makes its adjustments that way. It will read the sound coming out of the radio, figure out, okay, what the heck is going on, and then fix it, flatten it out, 
and then you could apply your bass boost to it. The basic idea of the key is to go into the car and by playing a few simple track and some programming, it does all your tune for you. You still have to set your gains. You have to get your gains right because if you get them wrong, it doesn't work. That is one of the caveats of key technology, but it has the indicator lights on there to tell you when you need to turn the gains down. <sighs> right? No problem. Don't worry. Once we get these wired up and into the car, we're going to walk you through the whole process of programming these because it's super cool. It is really cool how this works and how it reads and does this stuff for you. The nice thing about both of these is you can grow with these amplifiers. So let's you put 204 on your car and it does all the fun things that it's designed to do and say a year from now you're like i really wish i had more power i want to upgrade my speakers you can use it as a line driver some of you guys that caught some of the videos we did in the past we actually had a 501 in the car and we were using that as a line driver into the 2400.1 to drive the quad box we were connected to that ford factory radio it was already eq'd and fixed there was no reason not to do it that amplifier took 10 volts of input so we just adjusted the gains down till we got below that we had them like seven volts, plenty of headroom there, and magic, boom, it worked like a champ. You could do the same thing with the 402, use that as a line driver into a bigger amplifier and make things louder that way if you wanted. So it's a win-win all the way around. Let's head into the car and take a look at what we're gonna be dealing with from the factory. You get this nice eight inch touchscreen. It has Android Auto, it has Apple CarPlay, but it sounds like crap. As you saw, it just doesn't have great speakers connected to it. There are tweeters up here in the A-pillars. We'll be putting our morale tweeters into but for the most part yeah it's what it is but it's got all the features you could ever possibly want built into it your air conditioning controls come up in here There's really no reason to replace it right now and that's why the key exists so we can keep these radios now to get this radio out the steps needed are pop this grill off there's two seven millimeter screws here put your panel pry tool here pop this there's two more screws here this whole front piece snaps off and we can get to our radio, which is located here. This is not the radio, this is just a screen. We need to get to this area right here where the CD player is. plug right here is where our T-harness plugs into. Make sure when you pull this out that if you unplug this plug, you plug it back in. I only say that because we've had several people do this and they're like, this screen doesn't work in It's, yes, you forgot to plug this back in. Ooh, my bad. To get this out this far, you do have to unplug your FM and your Sirius XM antennas here, but then it'll easily come out, unplug it, plug it back in, you're good to go. The other thing, depending on what you're gonna be doing in this dash, removing this piece of plastic Plastic right here, cut it here, cut it here, push that out first. Does make it easier to work in the area. Like we will mount crossovers, load resistors, and we can attach them to the top of this radio and then just slide them all back into place with this removed. In this case, we won't have to do that because the load resistors are built into the amplifier. It's just a helpful tip. As you can see, when you get up into the dash, there is some room here. So if you do want to mount something small, if we were just doing the kicker key, we probably could hide it in this area here. We're not gonna be doing that. For our install, we'll be going here in this area. Fernando is doing a basic sound treatment on this door. The customer has supplied the sound treatment for us. What are we using? Second skin. What do you think? Do you like it? Eh, this is really rough to work on. Not a fan. That's Sorry personal. guys. Anyways, what we're gonna be doing on this is what we call a basic plus, which is concentrating all our energy on this aspect of the door panel here. Mm -hmm. It's not a full baked potato. With this level of speaker that we're using, don't, nice Oro, we don't need to go super crazy. Just hit the points like this area here where this, you know, might rattle. We'll put the vapor barrier back on and everything will be good here. 
for this install, we're gonna be using the Maximal Ultra 602's six and a half inch two-way component system. Inside the box, get a cool Morel sticker and the instruction manual. It comes with grills, two passive crossovers. These are pretty small, kind of like that. They're not gonna take up a lot of room. Now, we won't be needing these in this installation because we are gonna be going full active front. Bag of screws, bag of insulated connectors, some goo to hold the grills together once you put those on so the grills don't fall off. The back mounting brackets for the tweeter cup, the mid base itself. These have a 180 watts peak, 90 watts RMS, four ohms, sensitivity is 90.5. You also get two of the speaker cups, as well as the tweeters come pre-mounted in the angle mount. These are, these are unique. So like this could mount onto a panel, sit in the corner of the dash like so and aim them at you. This piece here obviously comes off and then the tweeter snaps out, the grill comes off, and you get down to that nice Morel tweeter with that cool little Y top that most of them have. For the rear doors, we're gonna be doing the Maximo Ultra 602 coaxles, six and a half inch coaxial system. Same as before, you get grills in the box with the instruction manual and a set of stickers, bag of screws, insulated terminals, goo for the grills, and then the coaxles themselves. These have 160 watts, 90 watts RMS, four ohm, 91 dB of efficiency. This is it here. When compared to the front door speaker, they are very similar. What's in the front door is this. This goofy six by nine looking speaker. This is gonna come out. We're gonna be using the brackets from Metra 82-5607s. That is this same shape as the factory to a six and a half. Now you'll notice it has these tabs here. It'll also fit a five and a quarter. This is just something they do on all their grills. So you are gonna have to break these out, which is simple enough enough, grab some duck bills, pull forward on them, and they will come right off. Apply some foam to this layer here and also to the back so that you don't get any rattle. Mount these into the door. Six and a half will go in there like so. And this will be in the front doors replacing this. For optimum sound quality, the Roadkill Fast Strings. This is a three-part system that is designed to improve the way the speaker sounds. So you see it has three pieces of foam here, different layers. This layer is designed to go into the back of the door panel. This next layer is designed to go onto the back of the speaker. That means it's going to sit just like this on the back side of the bracket here, and that is going to force all that energy into this plug. But the most important part of all of this is this guy right here. This is the front piece. It's gonna go over the speaker here, and this is gonna sit on the front of the speaker. It's gonna look something like this. What that's gonna do is that's gonna marriage up with the door panel. You do have to trim these in some cases. Don't leave them this long, because what happens is you can see when they squish down, they bend, and when they bend, they can crush the surround of the speaker and actually do more harm than good. So you're gonna test fit them, make sure that the door panel mounts nice. This is the fast ring from the factory. As you see, it has this. So for all of you going, ah, it's just foam. No, the factory has it built in. It's the same foam. It's actually the same exact foam. And as you can see, the reason why you're gonna need it is this is deeper than this. We have to make up that difference. And also we wanna make sure that just like the factory, our speaker marriages up to the door panel. Why we want to do that is to make sure that this sound wave coming off of the back of the speaker doesn't interfere with this sound wave coming off of the front of the speaker because this is the opposite of this. And when you have two signals that are opposite, they cancel each other out. So when you just run this in the door, that back wave can get around front and add cancellation. Also, when this goes into the door, sound is gonna go everywhere, all around here. And without this to focus that energy forward, you're gonna be losing some of that sound off into the door panel. It'll cause rattles, you'll lose mid bass. It's weird, but trust me when I say this, these really work. And if they didn't, then why would the factory do it? They're trying to get as much bass out of this cheap speaker as possible, and by just adding this little cheap piece of foam around here, it's actually doing it for them. Manufacturers have been using it for years, but for some reason in our industry, aftermarket wise selling this people I don't know I don't I don't need it you're silly for not doing it tiss tiss shame on you for the rear doors it's not a six by nine it's a six and a half and the brackets we'll be using is the 82 5605 and just like the front door speaker it's not a normal shape looking at it from the back side here you can see it has this weird notch here this little bump here another weird notch here it also has these brackets in there that you'll have to break out but this is the exact same shape of the rear door 
door speaker so this will allow us to go back in maintain those three screws put our door speaker in add our fast rings of course we get as much mid bass as humanly possible out of our aftermarket speaker after a little bit of time fernando has finished our basic sound treatment onto the door you can see the plug mounted back there with the room to clear the window make sure when you're doing this you make enough room to clear the window and then on the back of the speaker we have the rear part all set and ready to go screwed in place the last step will be putting the front fast string on he's put a notch in it to clear where the wire plugs in take your time stretch it around the outside of the bracket you want to do that so that if you have to remove the speaker for any reason you're not wasting the fast ring when these first came out people were sticking them on top of the speaker and if they had to change the speaker you just destroyed your expensive fast ring rollover that we were talking about is this so if this pinches up like that the next step is to put the door panel on look underneath and figure out where you have to trim this because this is going to have to be trimmed there's no reason it has to stay this thick remember when looking at the factory speaker it's shorter probably going to have to remove maybe a half inch off of the front of this so you can see it right there now to figure out and make sure you want to take a super bright light and you can see into the grill sometimes you can look up through here and see you can crawl underneath and look up but you have to check it to make sure you get this part right it's a good way to destroy and ruin a beautiful set of speakers. And we've seen it done. Yeah, so we're gonna cut it. Make sure you have a sharp blade. You don't want to jag it all up. Remove the half inch that needs to be removed on it. Slowly, as to not cut the speaker. Don't, ah! Breathe, man, breathe. With it done, it's time to get the door panel back on and wrap this side up. And then you get to move on to the other three doors. Yay! Similar to the front door, we did what we call our basic treatment here, and that we're just focusing around just the speaker itself. We've put pieces in the back because we put the fast rings on. At one point, he may decide to go and do a full baked potato, and we don't want to waste the fast ring. So with that, we can get the speaker mounted in place, get the front fast ring on, and you're going to repeat the same process. You're going to test fit it and make sure. You can always use the factory speaker as a guide to figure out how deep that needs to be. Cut it up and get her done. That's two. Done. Two more to go. Yay! For adding the components into the car and going full active, we have to do a little bit of wiring. The factory, this 6x9, and this tweeter are on the same wire. And the kick here, there's a Y where it goes off into the door and then up into the DAC. Because we're going to be using an active crossover, even if we were going to be using a passive crossover, we need to split those two wires. To do that, we're going to be running new wires into the tweeter because it is the easier of the two to do. What we would do if we needed to do something like that is we just go to that kick where the Y is. We would run our wires to that point, to the wire that goes into the door, and of course run a new wire up to the tweeter. Most of the time in these S150s, we're always running new wires for the tweeters. We run them into the center here behind the radio, which is where all our wiring comes from the amplifier. That's so that we can connect into that T harness that we have, both for the signal output to the amplifier and the output of the amplifier back into the factory wiring. But we need to get this a pillar off in order to do that we also need to get it off so that we can take it over to the bench and figure out how we're going to mount the tweeter to do that you need a 10 millimeter socket there's two bolts behind the clips that just clip off and it comes right out let's take this over to the bench and we'll take a closer look at this factory tweeter on the back side of the a pillar there's two phillips screws when you pull those off, you get access to the tweeter itself. It mounts with this shape here. What we have to put into it though is a considerably bigger tweeter. It's not that much bigger, but it's definitely bigger. And in the box, they don't give you any mounts for it. Now the one nice thing is that because it does have this bridge here over the tweeter, we don't have to worry about the dome being exposed to this grill. I like to run these commando style with no grill on them because I don't want a grill. And then another grill because all those little holes might cover each other and it could reduce the amount of volume coming out of the tweeter into the car. Shy of cutting a big hole in here, which would look ugly, we need to be able to mount it behind here, but yet still get as much sound passed through that factory grill as possible. We have to do a little design work 
and get this piece cut in order to fit this tweeter. To do that, we are gonna be using a laser. To design this tweeter, we've done plenty of F-150s. I'm going to check to see if we've ever done one for Morel, and if not, I'll just grab the basic file we have and we'll modify it to fit this tweeter. We have done a lot of F-150 tweeter mounts, and what we wanna check to see is if we've done one for Morel before, which, looking at this, we have We'll open that file. What I want to check is the diameters to see if this is the right size. It looks like this was a three-piece set that we built. Very close to what we're going to need. Now, if I remember right, the last time I did this on the Morels, they have three little spots. And I don't think I took these into consideration last time and I had to go in and put those in after the fact, which on this drawing here, they'd go here and here. So I want to add those in, fix that. All right, let's take a look at these. The three pieces. The one with the smaller hole goes on to the front of the speaker like this. The one with the bigger hole comes around to the back side of it. And then the one that we modified with the two extra holes is gonna be glued to that and that'll be the back piece. Once these two screws go in, that'll hold the tweeter. It sandwiches in between and will screw it into place. That way, if we ever need to service it, it just unscrew two screws and it, it all comes apart. To get this paper off of here, believe it or not, the best thing to use for acrylic to not scratch it is to use another piece of acrylic. Grab the pieces that we need to glue together and put them in place. This longer area is where the wire runs. We want the wire to run down. That means we want these two to line up like something like this. What I like to do to get them to hold in place is take some blue tape and just blue tape them together. Blue tape is thin enough to where you can see the seam and make sure you get it all lined up nice and tight. Grab our acrylic glue. This is very fast set. It evaporates, so there's no point in filling the container up. I just squeeze the bottle down, stick it into the glue and it will suck up enough glue to do what I want. Roll it around the corners. This is very fast, so we just have to hold it for like a minute. It does take like five or 10 minutes to set up perfectly and be nice and rigid. If you're gonna be gentle with it to do a final test fitting, that'll work perfect. Yeah, right? Pretty cool. With all the pieces glued together, we added some foam into it here to make it marriage up with this. Just like when you're adding foam to the doors and you're checking that area do the same thing I have this really bright light right here and I'm looking in there to make sure none of my foam has rolled over and gotten way of the tweeter I'm gonna pass this over to Fernando he'll finish taping this up getting his ends on it and running the wire into the dash now with both of these amplifiers being so small this would probably fit behind the radio like we were talking about this is a little bigger, but it's still pretty small. In an F-150 though, there's tons of room right here, which is where we're gonna mount these somewhere like this here and here. We are going to also be using some power distribution because we have a four gauge that we're running and we need to split it off to the eight gauge and the 10 gauge for this amplifier. When figuring out placement of your amplifier, something to keep in mind is the controls. You wanna be able to get to them. They're important and they're extra important on these amplifiers. This end of this amplifier, all we have is power protect and the main power plug. We're not gonna need to see this end for anything. And on this amplifier, it's designed the same way. We definitely need these two ends easily accessible. If we mount the amplifiers with those towards the top, like this, that'll definitely make our job the easiest. We could also go sideways with them here and we can see the controls on this end as well. But what to think about is where's the signal? How is that going to route? Do I need to keep it away from my power? In my mind, when I'm placing amplifiers, I'm always thinking about which way the wires are gonna route. The signals are here on this side, which is the total opposite of the power. If I mount them face up like this, I can bring all the signal this way down and over to the passenger side of the car, which is where we typically run them in a F-150. Power will come out of the bottom of the amplifiers and go towards the driver's side. 
There again, typically how we run them in an F-150. And that'll keep everything segregated away from itself so that none of them are in the same area. I think this is definitely the way to go. I'm going to leave a gap between the amplifiers so they have plenty of room to breathe. And also I'm going to put them on small risers to get the backs off of the plastic. For this, we're gonna be using a quarter inch piece of plastic is gonna be the thickness. I just haven't decided yet whether I wanna go ABS or the blown PVC Sentra. This isn't gonna be a big amp rack, so Sentra would be the one to choose on this because it is very small. I don't have, I'm not going way over here onto this side to do it. For screwing it in place, two options are available to me. If I remove this little piece of carpet right here, I can drill a hole and and put a nut cert there. This does not go out to the outside of the car and screw it in, or I can pull this 10 millimeter bolt here and use this to hold my amp rack in place. When we do big, long amp racks, we like to go into this area here because I wanna have a big, flat area to reduce the amount of twist that my amp rack will have because it's gonna be going way off to the side. And this installation, with it being a small, these aren't very heavy. I don't need a big footprint here. That's not to say I can't make something that has a U-shaped cut here that brings it in, which I might do. I need to take some measurements and figure out how big of a piece of plastic I need. The basic shape we're going for is this area here is what's gonna screw in, and then just a basic rectangle. Our height, go into this bolt, used to be 18 inches tall. I don't like going all the way over to this edge. There is a nipple right here. This is where I like to stop my amp rack. That way I have room for my wire to go in. Sometimes we'll cut this carpet to let the wire go into place. And if I marriage it right up with this, then I have to notch my plastic. I don't need this extra inch. I have plenty of room here. So we'll come across 14 and a half. And that is our overall dimensions. Now what we're gonna do with that, cut out for the right height for this. Coming from the floor up, we're at 13 and 5 eighths. What I'm doing is I'm coming from this area here, measuring where my first cut needs to be. I'm gonna remove this corner. My second cut, my, my U as it was, needs to be at three and three quarters, as well as four and a quarter. I'll remove that area here, and then I'm gonna bring that back up and there'll be a square in this area, and that's gonna stop at seven and a half. It's wonderful to talk about all these cool shapes and whatnot, and be like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Let's just cut it out and I'll show you. And this is what we end up with. So this is what I was talking about, this groove here. Now to know where we're gonna drill this hole for this bolt, all you have to do is press really hard onto this material. It'll leave a mark here on the back so we know where to drill. We ended up going with the blown PVC Sintra. We always round off our edges on this and someone asked recently how we do that. We use this little guy right here. This is a small round over bit from Mobile Solutions. And it's connected to a Bosch micro router. And it sits of course in front of our vacuum. So when we're done, we can just brush it all into the trash. As you've guessed, next is to get this over to the bench, get the amps mounted in place, get all our dials and switches and everything turned on and set, get the wiring done to get it into the car. Back on the bench, let's get these amplifiers preset to go into the car. By preset, I I mean, get them to a safe setting. We'll adjust them once they're in the car. When we first power it up, we don't want them to be like gain turned all the way up, crossover off, all those fun things. So just go through it real quick, gain off, boost off, set your crossover, set your subsonic filter, and then you have two switches here, high level input, you wanna make sure it's set for high level. DC offset, we can leave off because we'll use this, the 204 to switch that. Auto turn on, first switch is going to be set to DC. Phase set to off. Compression, we're gonna leave that off. Buy amp mode is going to be on. Kicker EQ, engaged time.
time delay engaged. Then we have a six and a half. We're gonna go for 80 hertz. That is these first two switches. These two switches both need to be in the down position. Our gain is zero on both sides. And that is pretty much it for the preliminary setup. Get our amplifier spacing the way we want it. The signal is gonna come down this side like we said. Then we have some distribution that we need to deal with. Because we are going to be running one power wire, we need to add in some fusing back here. According to the manufacturer, this takes a 20, this takes a 60, that's 80 amps. The problem that we have is we typically only stock the mini fuses like this, and the smallest I can get this is a 30. So that's kind of a bummer. Maxi fuses will go down to a 20, but I don't stock any maxi fuse holders. I haven't stocked those since like, I don't know, the early 2000s. What we have is two power distribution blocks. And these are the Stinger SHD20s. They'll do zero and four inputs and four and eight outputs. Plan is to put these two guys like this here and I can run our power and ground into them. Next, this small fuse holder for this amp's power and then the fuse holder that comes with the amplifier, I'm going to mount that here as well and that'll be my fuse distribution. It's not the prettiest way to do it. However, we're not worried about pretty. I mean, we are, but performance has always gotta be the first thing you think of. And in this case, proper fusing, the right size fuse is way more important than whether it's aesthetically pleasing, you know, because it's two different style fuse holders. It's really not that important. We'll still make it look the best that we can. Let's get started screwing this stuff down and getting it all taken care of. In case you were wondering what bass knob you need in order to control this guy, it is the Kicker CX ARC. When you're building your amp rack, there's a couple different layers of accomplishment that you go over, at least in my mind, and how I work this. You have your input, your output, and your power. And those three things have to be done in a specific order, depending on how this is all gonna pan out. In this case, in this corner of the amplifier is the signal, which is gonna be divided over onto this side. Getting these in place so that you know which way you're gonna route them away from the power, like step one. Step two, because in this, we're gonna be running speaker wires along with this, meaning they're all gonna go to the same direction, as opposed to, let's say, some are gonna go this way, some are gonna go that way, is figuring out okay, where does that next piece need to happen? So this would be like one, this would be two. We've made our bend here, this is here, and now we're going to attach these to some speed wire, which is a nine conductor wire that has the same colors as these in them to go off to the front of the car. But separating this out so that you have some level of accomplishment as you go does help, as opposed to just like going at it like a, you know, it's like I'm gonna do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. No, finish one aspect of it and then move on to the next so we're gonna get these done and then we'll move on to the power side or we'll start with the power and get the power done and then we'll move on to the, to the wiring side the reason why you want to do that is so you don't forget anything nothing's worse than getting something all done and you jumped around and then you're like oh my gosh I totally forgot about the remote turn on or the base knob or something like that We're two-thirds of the way through with the amp rack. We have the signal done now. We have the speaker wire connected. Let's take a look at some of the things that are going on here. 
We have two pieces of speed wire, and when we run two pieces of speed wire like this, it's much easier to put them in braided sleeving. And the F-150, where this mounts on the driver's side, it has to pass all the way across to the passenger side, and there are spots where you can see it. That means I like to cover it in the braided sleeving through that area and down into the floorboard. This got covered pretty much up into where it's gonna come into the dash. With speed wire, it is insulated enough. It's a double layer of insulation, so this this is just purely for aesthetics. It has nothing to do with form and function like you would on a power wire. There's a remote wire here. And we talked about this having DC offset and it, it doing what it needs to do. The reason why we've attached one of the remote turn on wires to come out, DC offset is a great feature and works most of the time. Because it works most of the time and not all the time, there might be a situation where you need a remote turn on wire to make this thing work. The speed wire has nine conductors in it. One of them is a remote turn on that's why there's nine it's the ninth wire it doesn't take any extra time to connect that wire up so that if you do run into a situation where it's like oh my gosh I need a remote turn on it's glitching it's doing something strange it's there already behind the radio and whatever you're gonna do to get your accessory wire to turn these on you don't have to tear all this back apart and run a wire in so it's kind of a no-brainer but you'd be surprised how many people don't do it for this though we're going to run this remote turn on wire is gonna loop over and come into this amplifier and then this remote turn on wire is also going to connect in at this amplifier So it's going to do this and that will allow us if we need to power this back up We can turn off the DC offset on this and then it will feed both amplifiers with that We can start now on the power side of things I'm going to start with getting the sub amp wired in first just because I want to see how that is going to lay out And then we'll come back and move over to this because this already has wire on it And we have that fuse holder that we have to mount somewhere into this so I'm not not as excited about working on that yet. I want to kind of think about that more and get the softball or the easy part of the wiring done. When running the power wire, we have two distribution blocks. What we want to keep track of is where power and ground is on our bigger here. Here it doesn't matter. These things can twist over each other. They're not super big wires. The ground is on the outside. The power is on the inside. If we come out of the power, go into the fuse box, we don't want to go to this far one because then the ground is going to have to go underneath it. It's simpler to just Take the quick U and use this as our power. And then we'll run the ground out to the outside and connect to this. With this style connector, which is a set screw that drives into the wire, we will be using a thing called a wire ferrule. That is this guy here. It's a sleeve that goes over the wire like this. Depending on the size of the wire, we can use a ferrule crimping tool that will make it attach on there. And when we put the wire into the hole, this is gonna keep it together. When you're using this threaded nut and it goes in there and it's just raw wire, it'll twist around and rip and tear. With the ferrule, it keeps it like a lug, nice and tight inside of there. Keeps all those little tiny wires where they need to go. Five hundreds power wire is ran. This is what I was wanting to do to figure out where all this has to go. Next, we're going to bring in these wires here. Now this fuse holder, the way this sits, it's got like a quarter of an inch that it's gonna raise up above everything. I'm thinking I'm just gonna put a quarter inch strip here to raise everything up to this level. And that'll also give me a riser over this ground to get into here. And then I'm gonna put a riser here so that this sits above the speaker wire. Before we start on this, and building that. I want to get the sub wire out because that's gonna come down in here, this area, and I wanna make sure that the piece I build sits, that the sub wire sits below that. For the sub, we have two 10 inch that are gonna get powered off of this. That means we're going to run a two pieces of 16 gauge to this amplifier so that it'll Y off and go to each speaker cup. So I made up our two runs of 16 gauge sub wire here. And as you'll notice, they go into one ferrule on each. So these are the grounds, these are the positives. We use a double ferrule. It has as an input for two wires and then we'll compress down into one. That allows us to run the two 16 gauge into it. We get all our ferrules from Ferrules Direct. You do have to buy a quantity. You can get things like this that you don't normally find anywhere else. It's all covered in braided loom. As it gets down here about halfway, it splits off into the two runs, one to go left, one to go right. If you're gonna be putting any type of labeled heat shrink like we did here onto it, make sure that you look to see what is positive and what is 
negative so that you get this right. It's unlike a power wire where it's just one wire and you can just spin it. You can't spin these. The one thing I will say about doing this is, or any form of, of work, you create quite a pile of tools because it's just like you want to keep them out of your, like when I used to build and fabricate, it was always just a pile of like your nail gun, your your heat gun, all your tools with just your rulers, your pencils, and they just all pile up and you, by the time you're done, you have these tools like around you, like a, an explosion of what you've been working on. In this case, we're done with the amp rack. We've put in our power and ground here across the bottom. We have our speaker wire coming out here. Sub wire is gonna go. The last step of this is to get our power and ground wire ran into these. Fernando's working on getting that through the car now, so we're just gonna take this into the car and we'll marriage it all up once we get in there. goes right into the factory groove. We have to run the wire over on through this side. Once you get the wire run up through the floor sill, what we found to be the best is to come up through here, pull out this pocket. How you get the pocket out, you remove the little rubber sill here, and behind it is a couple, couple screws, two. This will unsnap. Of course, you have to drop down the glove box. Up in here is a nice factory wiring harness to zip tie it to and then it'll snake up behind the radio. Once there you can pull the radio out and we can attach our wiring harness. Let's prep our FD2 harness for going into the car. First thing I like to do is remove all this tape. There's usually a seam somewhere that you can get to. On this harness there's a constant 12 volts the two data wires and all eight of the speaker wires, and they Y out of this little junction here. What I do is I remove all of this heat shrink so that I can cut this portion out, but leave it intact, and I put new heat shrink over it. You can also depin power and ground here, slide them out, remove the wire from this part of it, and then slide it back in place. Comes out flush cutters, make sure you cut the right side, and reinstall the pin. And it sinks in there about an eighth of an inch, so you don't have anything to worry about that wire exposed to anything. For the two data wires, basically the same process. Remove the heat shrink off of here, and cut out the harness. And then we're done with this, just throw it away. And this one is the one that gets confusing because you have the wires so close to the end here. So just pay attention and cut off this plug here. Repeat it the next eight times. Once you get the harness plugged in and all connected up, put the front of the radio back on. Leave the pocket off for right now, just in case you have to get back in there. No reason to make any more work than necessary. That means the amplifiers are all set. They're in place, firmly secured. Fuse holder is mounted to the battery and the wire is zip tied up in place. That means it's time to set up the amplifiers. You're gonna do one at a time. We're gonna start with the four channel and then we'll move on to the monoblock. 
block. That means we're gonna unplug the mono block for right now. We also wanna get our lighting and everything out of the car, all our seat covers and all that, because we're gonna be closing the doors and making it quiet for it to do its testing. But let's head over to the bench and we'll walk you through the instructions to set this thing up. And when you get a car into the install bay, the first thing you wanna do is take your tape measure and measure the seat position. Do this before you do anything. Measure from the knee buster, not the steering wheel. Don't measure anything to the steering wheel because the steering wheel can move and it can screw things up. So go to things that are permanent, the top of the dash, the knee buster, and measure from the knee buster to the front of the seat, from the floor up, from the knee buster to the butt of the seat here, from the top of the dash to the top of the seat. If there's any lines in the seat, in this case, there's a line in the center, measure to that. Measure from the headrest up, so you put the headrest back in place. Get all these measurements, take as many as you want, so that when you're done, you can line the seat back up to where it was, do all your DSP testing, set up your microphones, and make all your adjustments. It's exactly where it was when it came in, and it'll be exactly the same place when it goes to leave, because you're gonna move the seat around. Slide it forward, slide it back, move it up, move it down to run your wiring, maybe put an amp under the seat. In the box, you should still have this cool strap right here, and your microphone. Don't lose these things. The best thing to do is put them back in your box after you've done all your unboxing. This is the strap that's gonna go over the headrest. There is a slight setup process to it that we like to do. This is to hold the wiring in place. We like to go through it, and then this sits underneath it like this, and you pull it, and you end up with this. And you take it over and you set it in the car on the headrest, facing straight up, straight up, as straight up as possible. Once in the car, it should look just like this. We're looking at it from the back seat. Then plug the wire into this area here on the amplifier. That is your mic input. What you're gonna need access to is this guy right here. This is going to be the on off stop start button. The next step is to make sure your gains are all the way down, which is the one thing we did right at the beginning. That's why we set those up. To do this test, they have to be all the way down. If they're not all the way down, this is not gonna work. The reason for that is the amplifier has a digital input. If it senses any clipping, any distortion, or anything like that, it's going to totally screw up the process. So gains need to be down. You're gonna turn them up once we're done, and it's already EQ'd. Close all the windows in the car, turn off the engine, turn off the HVAC. Make sure you're in a quiet area essentially. It says in most cases bi amp switch will be off. In this case it is going to be on because we are using bi amping. Start the pink noise track. You're going to need a pink noise track. You can get all the test tones that you're gonna to need to do this on Kicker's website. That's what the QR code is for, is so you can go there and download all the tracks. I download them all to my laptop and then store them in Dropbox so that I can access them on my phone. I have my pink noise on my phone. One thing I like to do is scroll down and put my phone in night mode or sleep mode. Therefore, I won't get all my text messages, my phone won't ring, I won't get any of that stuff. Because if you do, you're gonna to have to start the process all over again. Start the pink noise. Set the pink noise volume to a level above conversational, slightly loud, using your audio source's volume control. Begin the auto setup by quickly pressing the key activation buttons. Once initialized, you will hear repeated tones, beep, beep, which indicates you must exit the vehicle and close the doors. You will have 10 seconds until the process begins. Once it starts, you're gonna hear all kinds of beeping, static, fun, just all these random noises. That's part of the setup process, but in the background, you need to have that pink noise playing. That's the only thing it doesn't provide for you. Once the auto setup is complete, you will hear happy music. It goes doo 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 and you're done. That's it, that's all it takes. Now this process could take anywhere between, let's say, two minutes to 10 minutes. Let's get back in the truck. A couple things that are not in the instructions. One, if it has auto lights like this one does, make sure you turn them off. You don't need your headlights on while everything is going on outside the truck. Two, go into the radio, make sure that your bass and treble are all set to zero. The other thing we wanna do is go into balance and fader and fade it all the way to the front because that is the only signal we're going to be feeding our amplifier. Rear is not not going to be part of this EQ setting because we're going full active front. We also like to turn off any of the speed, compensation, volume. Get, just turn all that crap off. If it has any form of seat positioning or anything like that, see what your options are. Driver, all seats. If it has an all seat selection, just leave it for all seats. If it has an off, just select off. The other thing you wanna do is while you're playing the pink noise at a normal listening level, is put your ear to all the speakers and make sure they're actually playing. That'll get you a fail if, if not. Turn it up to a love conversation the doors are unlocked. We'll grab our test button. That's the sound we're looking for. Now it's gonna start its little thing.
And that's the happy noise we're looking for. Right now you'll notice there's no sound. And then there's sound. If everything went according to plan, which that happy tone usually means, we should have a EQ'd, nice sounding, imaged perfect system. Hop back in, we'll play one of our test songs just to test it before we head on to the next part. Naturally, one of the cool things you can do is turn on and off that EQ to see what before and after would be. It is a really cool demo to do, so you can hear it on and off and let the customer decide, or yourself for that matter, decide what they like. Now keep in mind, you have those dip switches to turn off time alignment and equalization, so if one of them is not working for you, you can turn them off independently. Most people decide to keep them on. It sounds really nice. Let's set the gains. For setting gains, you need some noises. You need some test tones and whatnot. This amplifier, it you can't pull the speakers on it like they're connected so the speakers are gonna be playing so playing like a, a 1k test tone is a bad idea plus it's a factory radio which makes it even a worse idea kicker on their website has a bunch of test tones to choose from and the test tone I like to use is for the new key LOC the key lock it's a gain match track for that it's a 20 to 20 sweep the nice thing about a sweep is obviously it's not gonna stay on that one frequency and just bake all day it sucks in the instructions turn the volume up up to three quarters on this which is like 24 25 and we're going to play the sweep i have fernando sitting in the front seat he's going to press play for me because there again i still don't want to camp out there's two lights on the amplifier here and here and what we're going to do is turn the knob until those come on and then kick it down a little bit until they're gone we don't want those on there so we'll start adjusting our tracks channel one and two are the tweeters so you have to wait for that high frequency in order to hear them. See it's on, we'll kick it back a bit. We'll move on to the next one. Okay, Fernando cut it. And that's it, the gains are set. Let's move on to setting up the 501. Let's head over to the bench and talk about how that's gonna happen. Grabbing the quick setup guide out of the box for the 500. Naturally, we wanna make sure the gains are turned down just like we did, but this setup is going to be a lot different how we set up the 204. First thing we're gonna do is gain match. So unlike the previous amplifier, we did the gain at the end, we're gonna do the gain at the beginning now. Make sure you scan that QR code on the box and download the 501 gain match tracks. That's important. We're gonna do the same thing in the sense we are gonna turn turn our volume up to three quarters. We'll turn it back up to that 25 where we were. Press and hold the key button for three seconds until the gain match LED flashes quickly three times. Wait for the thing to flash three times before you lift the button. If it doesn't, it's not going to work. Start the gain match track. The amplifier is going to mute the output, so it doesn't matter whether your speakers are hooked up or not, it's going to mute the output to them. With the gain knob all the way down, slowly turn the input gain clockwise until you see the gain match LED light up, then turn it down. Just like we did before, turn it up. Once it's on, turn it down. It's gonna play the same style sweep track, so you have to wait till that cycle comes back around. That's what a sweep track does. So it'll go, you know, you heard that whoop, whoop. It's gonna take a minute, but there again, don't camp out. We'll have Fernando controlling the volume for us. When you're done and it has been set, quickly press the key button, exit gain match mode. Now you're gonna start the logarithm mode. Press and hold the key button for five seconds until the gain match LED goes solid. All right, so this is important. Before blink three times, now it's gonna go solid. Make sure it goes solid and just doesn't blink three times. It's going to blink three times. Keep holding it until it goes solid. Then release the button. Start the 501 sweep track. While the key logarithm is running, the gain match LED will flash slowly. This process may take up to a minute and a half. After the sweep finishes, gain match LED will go dark while it is calculating the corrections. This takes about 30 seconds. If the logarithm runs through successfully, the gain match LED will begin to flash rapidly for 1.5 seconds. If the logarithm fails, the gain match LED will go solid. In the event of failure, just go to the troubleshooting section of the owner's manual. Let's head back into the car. One thing I do need to do, I'm gonna be unplugging the signal. Because of that, the remote turn on DC offset isn't gonna be feeding the key. I have to go in and turn on that DC offset so that it'll turn this amplifier on when we turn on the car. And then when we're done, we'll turn that back off because it's getting fed by that amplifier. Hold the button. We got our flashes. Turn up our gain. See our gain there is blinking. Turn it back down. Wait a second. All right, we got it. Hit the button. Now we'll move on to the next track. Press and hold. 
We got our flashes. All right, solid. Now it's gonna blink slowly, so we can see here. The light went out. And we get our quick succession of blinks. That means that this is all set up. At this point, you can apply your bass boost, adjust your crossover if you need to. I like bass boost, so I'm gonna add some of that in there. Obviously, playing some music will be the best way to set up how much bass boost you want. I'm gonna turn off my DC offset and plug back in my highs amplifier before I forget. Cool. If you'd like to see what the inputs and outputs look like, we have videos on both the kicker key, highs amp, and the sub amp showing you input and output curves, how they look on an RTA. If you're curious uh, more about that. I'll put links to both of them in the description down below. Now we need to get this subwoofer enclosure in the car so we can finish this thing up and hear some bass. Oh, one other thing, to control the subwoofer. If you have an F-150, this is a great place to mount your volume knob. All right, let's hear this all together. We have bass, turn that up. Ooh, I can already hear it already. We got our highs. We brought the fader back in so the rear speakers are now playing. Let's just turn it up. We got plenty of bass. It is definitely nice. I like it so far. Let me go back and I want to hear some vocal to mix it all together and finish it off. Yeah, they're living the good life. I'm happy. Now I'm going to bring Fernando in and let him listen to it and see what his take on it is. And then we'll compare notes. All right, Fernando, what do you think? Amazing. One word answer, amazing. I'll go a little bit more than that and you can agree or disagree with me. I'm gonna go with the amazing, but the amount of power you get out of these is just blows your mind. Yeah. I mean, every time I do one of these, I still am like, Gee, I cannot believe something that small puts out that much power. And I own the set. I mean, I physically own a set of these in Haley's car. Yeah. So I know what they sound like. I know what they can do. It's impressive. It's yeah. definitely impressive. But it's just like when you hear it again in a different car, you're like, oh, wow. Oh, yeah. yeah, it actually sounds good, you know, it's like... Because you look at it and you think, they should have made that like twice the size. I think if it was bigger, people would be like all over it. Fear not, my friends. No, no, no. It's like, hey, perfect, under the seat, behind the seat. In the dash. In the dash, whatever you're gonna put it, it's plenty of space for that. Even though it's two amplifiers, this is like the perfect little five channel amplifier. If you wanna get into DSP, you wanna get into EQ, you don't wanna learn all the ins and outs of how it's supposed to, you don't wanna learn any of that. You no. just want it to, you just press the button. Do its thing. This is awesome. You'll get into a car. And the cool thing is, is you can hear it with it and without it, like yeah. I was doing. And it's like so sweet. Yeah. Of course, we're going to demo it like that to the customer so that they can get I know what you're thinking. You should show the surprise. Not going to, because he probably doesn't want to be on camera. Most people don't want to be on camera, guys. Mm -hmm. Let's end the show. Until the next one, guys. You guys have a great night as always. We'll see you later next time. Bye. Bye.